Well, yes, it's amazing. We, we come to the, <laughs> the last of the lectures. And uh, the subject is Broad Church Today. A broad church today is biblical, evangelical, and Catholic. And I shall discuss each of these terms briefly in the light of what I've been saying in the previous lectures. I begin with the Bible. The Bible is an astonishing human achievement, yet it would not exist at all if God did not wish to communicate with the human race and enter into fellowship with it. The Bible exists because of God's initiative. People did not write it down because they wanted to further their own interests or to lord it over others. To me, one of the remarkable things about the Bible is the way that it shows that those who hear the call of God and respond to it become involved in a ministry of considerable suffering. Further, because it would be callous to suppose that God causes people to suffer in his name without suffering himself, we can see in the sufferings of his servants what it costs God to be involved in our world in such a personal way. And I shall now illustrate this from the way in which a number of great people are portrayed in the Old Testament. Now, as I said in a previous lecture, these are not historical narratives in the modern sense. They are the product of what we call the cultural memory of the ancient Israelites, the people of God. And so these great people are representative of the experiences of many people who were in different ways involved with the call of God. So although I shall use names such as Abraham and Moses, we have to remember that in a way these are representative types gathering into themselves many experiences. Abraham, the founder of the nation, is asked to leave his home to migrate to a far-off land about which he knows nothing, and where he experiences famine almost as soon as he's arrived. He suffers the agony of believing that God wishes him to sacrifice his only son, and although this is not required, it does not lessen the pain and anguish of Abraham as he makes the journey to the appointed place and faces the possibility of having to commit an appalling act. Moses, the great leader of his people at the time of the Exodus, has to endure the constant complaint and criticism of the people he has led to freedom. And because of the obstinacy of the people, he is condemned with them not to enter the promised land, but to view it only from a distance. David, the greatest of the kings of the Old Testament, is presented as a flawed character, one who becomes guilty of adultery and murder and pays the penalty for this by seeing his family disintegrate into fratricide, rape and rivalry. Solomon, the great builder of Jerusalem and the temple, is shown to preside over a kingdom whose social divisions and injustices lead to its disintegration after his death. The fate of some of the prophets resembles that of Moses. To Jeremiah is given the awful commission to preach that God is fighting against Jerusalem and will destroy it because of the sinfulness of the nation. His message brings threats against his life, imprisonment, and at the end of his life, exile in a place to which he does not wish to go, and where the people taunt him by saying that their troubles have come about only because they took notice of his preaching. In chapters 40 to 55 of the book of Isaiah, 
there is portrayed a servant of God who during his lifetime is despised and rejected. It comes as no surprise that in the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus is ultimately one of suffering and apparent failure. Even his closest disciples do not understand the nature of his mission. And at the time when he faces mocking, torture, and the unimaginable pain of crucifixion, his closest male followers desert him and deny that they ever knew him. There is a remarkable passage in Isaiah chapter 63 that says, and I quote, In all their afflictions he, God, was afflicted. The Bible is the record of what it costs individuals to respond to the call of God and what it must therefore cost God himself. We can get some small idea of this by imagining how parents suffer if and when they see their children suffering. This is what we might call the storyline of the Bible, but the Bible is also a library, including, among other things, philosophical works such as Job and Ecclesiastes, which meditate profoundly upon the problem of innocent suffering. And there is that great treasury of psalms that range from awesome praise of God to anguished cries for help in the face of persecution, injustice, physical illness, and the approach of death. The Bible is essential for a broad church, but it must be the Bible read with the help of biblical criticism and the benefit of the profound discussions that have taken place in the 20th century about what we call hermeneutics, or the theory of interpretation. It is at this point that a modern broad church is at its furthest distance from the great figures of the mid-19th century, who otherwise are the source of so much inspiration. When F. D. Morris, Charles Kingsley, and F. W. Robertson were active in their ministries, Biblical criticism in Britain hardly existed and was regarded with the greatest suspicion. It was not until late into the 19th century that churches in Britain were able to begin to come to terms with biblical criticism. As late as 1881, the brilliant young Scottish scholar William Robertson Smith was dismissed from his post at the Free Church College in Aberdeen because of an article that he'd published on the Bible in the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We cannot blame Morris, Kingsley and Robertson for being men of their time, but I'm certain that if they were alive today, they would see the necessity of biblical criticism for presenting the Christian faith to intelligent honest and thoughtful people. What this means is that a broad church must find ways of ensuring that its members are familiar with biblical criticism and modern methods of interpretation at their best and have the confidence to see that they can liberate them from narrow views of biblical literalism. Much of my own popular writing over the past 40 years has been directly precisely to this end. But it is still, alas, the case that for the majority of people who attend church, the Bible is an unread book and biblical criticism is seen as a threat to Christian belief. A broad church must emphasize the centrality of the Bible, must ensure that its members have an extensive knowledge of its content, that they know how biblical criticism and modern approaches to interpretation can throw great light 
on that content and help readers and listeners to encounter the God who speaks his word through its pages. So part two. A broad church must be evangelical because it is biblical. If the Bible exists because of God's initiative in stretching out to the human race in love and mercy, the evangelistic task of a broad church must be to enable people to respond to that initiative. Now, it is common ground among many churches that there is a gulf between God and humanity that has been caused by humanity's wickedness and evil. A broad church must take this seriously. The question is, how is that gulf bridged? According to one view, God is so alienated by human wickedness that he cannot have fellowship with human beings unless the penalty for human wrongdoing is first paid by the sacrificial death of Christ. This view is not acceptable to a broad church because it is not in accord with the teaching of the Bible. Paul tells us that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not reconciling himself to the world. And further, the view that God cannot forgive sin until Christ has died on the cross makes nonsense of many passages in the Old Testament. When the psalmist says in Psalm 103, I quote, Look how wide also the east is from the west, so far hath he set our sins from us. Are we to suppose that the psalmist does not mean what he says? Are we to suppose that he is not expressing his own joy at the experience of God's forgiveness, but is actually looking ahead to something that will only be possible in several hundred years' time after Christ has died on the cross? When the psalmist prays in Psalm 51, turn thy face from my sins and blot out all my misdeeds, make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Are we to suppose that this is a completely useless and pointless prayer, one which God cannot answer, because God will not die on the cross for many hundreds of years? And in Romans 10, 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah 65, quote, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people, end of quote. However, Paul and the writer of the Isaiah passage must have been mistaken. How could God stretch out his hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people if he was so repelled by their wickedness that he needed the sacrifice of Christ to enable him to draw near to them. In the previous verse, Paul also quotes from Isaiah 65, 1, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. However, this again would be impossible on the view that without the sacrifice of Christ, there can be no contact between God and sinful humanity. A further implication of this approach is that unless and until a person has accepted that Christ died for his sins, he must forever remain alienated from God. A broad church will find quite unacceptable a use of the Bible which ignores its obvious meaning and prefers instead a theory that makes nonsense of much of what the Bible says. A broad church sees the Old Testament as the record of God reaching out in love and mercy to a rebellious and disobedient people. Sometimes that love and mercy are recognized and accepted, sometimes not. God remains in touch with his people as much through his judgment 
as through his promises of salvation. In the New Testament, God in Christ enters personally into the human wickedness which creates the gulf between the divine and the human. He overcomes it by means of his selfless love on behalf of others, and he offers to God a perfect sacrifice of a life that has defeated sin and wickedness on behalf of others. In that he has represented the whole human race, the gap between God and humanity has been bridged. However, it is imperative for humans to know that this is the case. If someone deposits in my bank account a large sum of money, this is no use to me if I do not know about it or if I do not attempt to draw upon it. The evangelistic message of a broad church is that Christ has redeemed the individuals who are addressed, that they are sons and daughters of God, not only by birth, but also by adoption. God wishes them to know this in such a way that their lives are transformed and that they are enabled to live in reliance and trust upon his mercy. The matter is put in this way in John's Gospel. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. There is, however, one thing to be said for the view that God can only forgive sin because of Christ's sacrificial death. It makes it clear that forgiveness is always costly and can never overlook the nature of evil or regard it as other than it is. It emphasises that the justice of God must be satisfied. How does a broad church take account of this? From a broad church perspective, judgment is part of the good news. The Psalms look forward to the coming judgment of God. In Psalm 96, we have the following words, I quote, Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea make a noise, and all that therein is. Let the field be joyful, and all that is in them. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh for he cometh to judge the earth, and with righteousness to judge the world and the people with his truth. This is surely something we can all affirm. Surely we desire to live in a better world than what human wickedness has made it. If God's judgment will deal with the wickedness in the world as well as that in our own lives, surely this is something to be welcomed. Judgment is part of the good news because it is God's judgment, the God who in Jesus Christ enters the world to bridge the gulf made by our wickedness. How that judgment will operate beyond the world of time, we do not know and should not presume to say except to affirm with F.D. Morris, who lost his job for saying so, that judgment is not everlasting torture. We must have the courage and trust to believe that God will have the last word and in his own way will defeat and transform human wickedness. I come lastly to the broad church as being Catholic. By Catholic, I do not mean that the Church of England has bishops in the succession of the historic episcopate. I mean that it is Catholic by being aware of its membership of the Church of Christ throughout the world. The Abbey, as a broad church, 
is part of the Church of England and the Anglican Communion, but it is more than that, and for this reason can and must take account of what is going on in churches beyond the Anglican Communion, including in some cases the Roman Catholic Church. A broad church must take account of what is happening in base communities, in the Catholic churches of Latin America, for example, must be aware of the liberation theology that it has inspired and which is not, alas, part of the church scene in Britain. Also, it must accept that there are churches which do not have the historic episcopate, but which theologically have much to teach us. Here I think especially of the German Lutheran churches. This situation resembles that of the 19th century broad churchmen, while there are obviously great differences. In my first lecture, I noted the importance of Germany and Lutheran theology for figures such as Coleridge and for Julius Hare, who was the mentor of Morris and Kingsley. On the other hand, the 19th century broad churchman could have had no conception of how the ecumenical movement of the 20th century and the German church struggle of the 1930s would change how we must regard the church today. It is in the light of these developments that I shall now speak about the role of a broad church in the life of the nation, and my thinking here has been much shaped by several articles written in 1933 by Dietrich Bonhoeffer in response to the assumption of power in Germany in 1933 by Hitler's National Socialists. If you're not familiar with Bonhoeffer, he was a, a brilliant young theologian. He was a member of the Confessing Church he was arrested in 1943 for his uh, activities against um, National Socialism and was executed in April 1945 on the orders of Hitler at the age of 39, only four weeks before the end of the Second World War. Very courageous young man. For Coleridge and Morris, the Church of England, by law established, was the national church and therefore had a role to play in the life of the nation. A modern broad church cannot accept this view. If we have learned anything from the German church struggle in the 1930s, it is that the church does not have its authority from the state, but from God. The state also is an order ordained by God and must be seen in that light. One of the troubles with the traditional Anglican view of the relation between church and state is that it has seen these two institutions rather like two self-contained circles with the smaller circle representing the church embodied within a larger circle representing the state. We need, in fact, a model that shows the two institutions to be mutually dependent. We might think here in terms of a marriage. A husband cannot be a husband unless he has a wife, and a wife cannot be a wife if she doesn't have a husband. From a Christian perspective, the state cannot exist without the church, and the church cannot exist without the state. At some periods in the history of the church, of course, the relationship has become one-sided. In the Middle Ages, the church had far too much power over the state and often controlled it. In today's world, the state has far too much power over the church and tends to ignore it. In May 1934, in the face of the threat to the church from the regime of Adolf Hitler, a synod of theologians meeting in Barman, 
um, in, in the Wuppertal Valley, formulated the Barman Declaration, which became the basis of the Confessing Church, which actively opposed Hitler. And I quote some extracts from that declaration. Scripture tells us that in the as yet unredeemed world in which the church exists, the state has by divine appointment the task of seeing to and maintaining law and peace by the fullest exercise of human insight and human capacity by means of the threat of force or means of the use of force. With gratitude and reverence towards God, the church acknowledges the benefit of this order which he has appointed. It is a reminder of God's kingdom, of God's commandment and righteousness, and so of the responsibility of both rulers and ruled. We reject the false doctrine that the state should or could go beyond its special task and become the sole and total order of human life, thus fulfilling also the church's vocation. We reject the false doctrine that the church should or could go beyond its special task and assume functions and dignities of the state, thus itself becoming an organ of the state. End of quotation. The important thing to notice about this is that it is biblical. It claims that scripture tells us about the divine appointment and function of the state. This claim is best illustrated from the book of Deuteronomy, where in chapter 17 it is commanded that the king who sits on the throne of his kingdom must write out a copy of the divine law, that he should read it all the days of his life, that through it he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and that his heart shall not be lifted up above his brethren. In my opinion, the Church of England should assert as publicly as possible that as a part of the universal church of Christ, even if it is a a rather small part, it has a mandate from God to declare the true relationship between church and state. If its established position in England makes it difficult for the church to do this, it should be ready and willing to forego its privileged position in law. In this way, it may save its life by losing it. In his book entitled On the Constitution of the Church and State, Coleridge stressed the importance of formulating what he called an idea of the nation. And this derived from his distinction between reason and understanding, which was the subject of the second lecture in this series. So that the idea was to be drawn from spiritual resources, including the Bible, human sensitivity and imagination. This is an important task for today's church, drawing upon all the theological resources of the worldwide church. For Coleridge, property was one of the pillars of his idea of the nation. In today's world, Property has ceased to be a pillar and has become a major problem. Property, in the sense of wealth, is responsible for the grotesque misdistribution of the world's resources, not only between rich and poor nations, but within rich and poor nations. The remarkable Jubilee legislation in Leviticus 25 decreed that every 50 years, land was to revert to the original owners in order to prevent the type of accumulation of land and wealth which was so roundly condemned by the prophets of ancient Israel 
Lovely example in Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field till there be no place. If one of the tasks of the church is to proclaim the unity of the human race in the sight of God, and that all humans are the children of God, and therefore brothers and sisters to each other, it must wage an unceasing war against those systems that depend upon wealth and property to disfigure so disgracefully the relationships between human beings. The kingdom of God is supposed to be a kingdom of right relationships. The human governance of the world without God has succeeded in establishing a kingdom of unrighteous relationships. Here, the battle is to be fought using the weapons of education, argument and convincement. The Bible contains visions which must surely appeal to anyone who has a modicum of sensitivity and a desire for fairness and justice. And the church must concentrate on articulating this greater vision rather than fastening on to small particular issues, however important they may be. If the church gives the impression that it is the Labour Party or the Liberal Democratic Party or even the Green Party at prayer, people will miss the larger vision which the church must articulate and proclaim and will misunderstand what the church is and what its mission is. The practical working out of the vision of a world that reflects God's lordship is not the business of the church, though that should not preclude the church from having practical agencies for helping the homeless, the destitute, and other casualties of the property-based system. In Coleridge's book on the Constitution of the Church and State, first published in 1830, Coleridge lamented the fact that education was becoming increasingly secularised. For him, this was a perversion of the proper distinction between reason and understanding, and denoted the triumph of understanding, that is, empirical knowledge, over reason, which was to do with aesthetic and spiritual knowledge. When we look at the education scene today, with the universities totally driven by matters of finance, it is hard to remember that universities developed from the cathedral schools in medieval Europe, and that the ancient universities were founded by the churches. Again, the broad churchmen of the mid-19th century did much to promote education, especially for women and for the working classes. A broad church today must see education as one of its top priorities, an education which should not be confined to, but which should pay particular attention to the Bible, biblical criticism and theology, precisely because these things hardly figure, if at all, in the state system at all levels. The broad church should do this because of its mandate from God to proclaim and bring into effect its belief that without God, humanity is incomplete. In the plans here at the Abbey, which we are currently discussing, we are hoping through publication and electronic means to do for our situation what the broad churchmen in the 19th century sought to do for theirs in the matter of education. At the end of the first lecture that I gave, I quoted from a sermon by F.W. Robertson of Brighton in which he saw the path 
that he was seeking to follow, not as a middle way, but as a deeper way. I hope that in these lectures I've given some indication of what a deeper way might mean for a broad church today.